begin by thanking the friends and comrades of the Workers and Punks University for inviting me to this fine conference and for giving me the opportunity to see the important political steps we're taking. And I hope I, we can continue to connect and that I uh, can be of help in, in your project. I also want to thank you for the opportunity to fall in love again with Ljubljana, which I haven't visited since 1986 when I came from Kumarvec. Um, now, let me begin simply by saying, uh, so, uh, making a statement that I've now copyrighted and an opposed me for this. Uh, that is, if you don't know where you're going, no road will take you there. Um, so it might be useful for me to say where we're going right now. Uh, my talk today covers a number of themes. One is the concept of contested reproduction versus primitive accumulation, which is the title of the talk. And that immediately introduces the question of struggle. Second, in this context, I'll talk not only about what Marx called original or primitive accumulation, but also what Priyoprojensky in the Soviet Union in the 1920s called primitive socialist accumulation. And that takes us into a discussion of NEP, the new economic policy, and you may hear more about NEP than you ever wanted to hear. Um, and in that context also, I want to, you to think about what you would think of as primitive socialist accumulation or original socialist accumulation without regard to how Priyoprojensky defined it. In other words, given your net, by now expert knowledge of primitive accumulation, what would be primitive socialist accumulation? Finally, I want to end by talking about the importance of a socialist vision. Uh, that's always important but it's especially important today given the announcement here of the beginning of a socialist initiative. So, let me begin. So-called primitive accumulation, Marx made clear in Capital, quote, is nothing else than the historical process of divorcing the producer from the means of production, close quote. In short, he said, it, quote, forms the prehistory of capital. And he continued, that primitive accumulation of capital, i.e. its historical genesis, was a process of producing the premises of capitalism before the existence of capitalism as such. Rather than situating this specific historical process in relation to the essence of capitalism, however, there has been a tendency to focus upon the methods by which this particular becoming of capital in England occurred. Thus, the state, brute force, a whole series of forcible methods, that's in quotes, are abstracted from their specific historical role and identified as the ahistorical theoretical category primitive accumulation. Not only does this substitute form for content, but it demonstrates the failure to understand Marx's theoretical method in capital. Marx described his method as one of moving from simple concepts to deduce an understanding of the whole as a rich totality of many determinations and relations. Through this process, he indicated, this is in the introduction to the Grundriss, thought appropriates the concrete, reproduces the concrete in the mind. We have in this way the logical construction of the underlying, quote, structure of society in which all relations coexist simultaneously and support one another. And that is precisely what Marx accomplished in Capital. Through a step-by-step -step process, beginning with the commodity, he developed the idea of capitalism as an organic system, one which produces its own premises, a system which has developed its own foundations. We see in chapter 23 of volume one of Capital that capitalism is a system which contains within itself the conditions for its own reproduction, one which, quote, when viewed as a connected whole and in a constant flux of incessant renewal, and quote, is understood as a process of reproduction. In particular, Marx concluded this chapter by stressing that the capitalist process of production, quote, produces and reproduces the capital relation itself, on the one hand the capitalist, on the other the wage laborer, end of quote. In other words, it produces its essential premises. In short, once capitalism has developed upon its own foundation, quote, Every economic relation presupposes every other in its bourgeois economic form, and everything positive is thus also a presupposition. This is the case with every organic system. That's from the Grundrisse. This understanding of the being of capitalism is absolutely essential, because without that understanding, we would not have the demonstration that capital is the product of the exploitation of workers. 
In other words, the capital is the worker's own product turned against them. Now, Marx has a very important, you know, extensive discussion of this question of the being and becoming of capital in the Grundriss. If you want to understand capitalism, Marx insists that you don't do it by examining its process of becoming. Just as if you want to understand the modern city, you don't do it by discussing the flight of serfs to the cities. This, he said, is, well, quote, one of the historic conditions and presuppositions of urbanism, but not a condition, not a moment of the reality of developed cities, end of quote. And in the same way, you don't focus upon the historic presuppositions of capital, which took many forms, among which were individual savings acquired from various sources. Marx stressed that the dependence of capitalism upon original savings, for example, quote, belongs to the history of its formation, but in no way to its contemporary history, i.e., not to the real system of the mode of production ruled by it, close quote. Understanding the being of capitalism allows us to study its becoming. Once Marx had identified the essential elements in capitalist relations of production as capital and wage labor, then he could focus upon the conditions, the precondition for the initial emergence of each. Theory, in short, guides the historical inquiry. Our method, Marx noted, quote, indicates the points where historical investigation must enter in. Understanding the nature of capitalism as an organic system, quote, points to a past lying behind this system, end of quote. But if we fail to distinguish between the being and the becoming of an organic system, we obscure the nature of such a system. Look at how the bourgeois economists distorted the nature of capitalism, Marx pointed out. But they confused the original source of capital with its source within capitalism. In other words, quote, by presenting the moments in which the capitalist still appropriates as a not capitalist because he is still becoming, as the very conditions in which he appropriates as capitalist. By treating capital as if it remains based on historic presuppositions like individual savings, the capitalist relation of production, and thus capital's dependence upon the exploitation of the wage laborer, disappears. This is why Marx explicitly distinguished between the accumulation of capital within capitalism as a system and the original accumulation, and why the former must come first in our analysis. That is what so-called primitive accumulation or original accumulation is all about. It interrogates history to ask only one question. What was the original source of the essential elements of capitalism? The methods by which this process occurred are purely contingent and based on particular circumstances. Nothing could be clearer. However, if we concern ourselves only with the focus upon the original sources of capital and wage labor, that can obscure the real process by which they emerged. Becoming is two-sided. It is both a coming into being and a passing away. The development of a new system involves a process of the subsuming of the elements of the labor process, human beings and means of production, under new productive relations. However, it's essential to recognize explicitly that those elements are being removed from other productive relations. In short, the expanded reproduction of one relation has as its counterpart the contracted reproduction of another. The new is being born while the old dies. This process of the development of the new, Marx indicated in the Grundrisse, quote, consists precisely in subordinating all elements of society to itself or in creating out of it the organs which it still lacks. This is historically how it becomes a totality, close quote. That process, however, is a process of struggle. It's what I've called contested reproduction. There are, in short, two processes of reproduction coexisting and struggling. The old does not die quietly. It struggles to stay alive. And the new struggles to be born. And in that interregnum, there are many morbid symptoms. And that is inherent in the process of contested reproduction. Now, in both The Socialist Alternative, my book's The Socialist Alternative, and also The Contradictions of Real Socialism, I credited Yevgeny Priopruzhensky as the theorist who made the most important contribution to an understanding of contested reproduction. He understood that we cannot look at a particular set of relations in isolation. Quote, not a single economic formation can develop in a pure form on the basis merely of the imminent laws 
which are inherent to the particular formation. This would be in contradiction to the very end idea of development. The development of any economic form means its ousting of other economic forms, the subordination of these forms to the new form, and their gradual elimination." Close quote. In the case of the Soviet Union in the 1920s, Priyoprzhansky argued that two systems were at war, and the outcome was not predetermined. Quote, the enormous preponderance of petty money production combined with the relative weakness of the state sector, he noted in 1927, forces the state economy into an uninterrupted economic war with the tendencies of capitalist development, with the tendencies of capitalist restoration." Uh, close quote. This struggle of the two systems was a war between two regulating principles, what Priyo Pujansi called the law of primitive socialist accumulation, and secondly, the law of value. Priyo Pujansi stressed, though, that the Soviet economy was regulated by neither the law of value nor that of primitive socialist accumulation. His essential and important insight was that there was not a simple combination or addition of the two systems and their associated regulating principles. Rather, the two systems interpenetrated. They coexisted, but they also limited and significantly deformed each other, and they generated dysfunction in the economy. Accordingly, from Priyoprzhansky's perspective, it was a serious error to look for balance between these two hostile and warring systems and principles. Rather than a simple addition which could take the best from both worlds, their combination generated unintended consequences like shortages, incoherence, and the possibility that the worst of both worlds would be the result. Thus, the war against the tendencies of capitalist development had to be won. It was Priyoprzhansky's insight about the effects of contested reproduction that I explored in my analysis of real socialism in the book Contradictions of Real Socialism. In particular, I concluded that the obvious dysfunctional character of real socialism in the period from the 1950s through the 1980s was not the product of a single productive relation, but rather the result of the interaction between two competing logics, neither of which was the logic of the working class. On the one hand, there was the logic of the vanguard, a perspective oriented toward building and organizing a new society from above and which regulated the system through a social contract which promised job security, subsidized necessities, and improving standards of time, but which also, importantly, prevented workers from having any power within the workplace, community, or society in general. The logic of the event. On the other hand, there was the logic of capital a logic embodied in the income-maximizing behavior of enterprise managers and most clearly articulated by their ideological spokespersons of capital, the economists. The economists whose mantra was free the managers, free them from petty tutelage, free them from the plan, free them from the social contract, and free them from irrationality. The combination and the mutual penetration of these two logics, I argue, produced not only the dysfunctional interaction between planners and managers, but the deformation of each logic and the worst of both worlds. In the end, I argue that the logic of capital triumphed, an outcome which had its roots in the fundamental contradiction of vanguard relations of production, which divides society into conductors and the conducted. To develop this analysis, though, it was necessary to attempt to understand the logic of both sides, as well as the underlying logic of the working class in real socialism. And that, I suggest, is essential for considering all cases of contested reproduction. To avoid one-sidedness is it important to understand both sides and the goals of its actors, rather than to focus simply upon the new that is struggling to be born. And here is where we can consider some aspects of Priyo Prezhensky's concrete application of his theoretical conception, his argument for rapid expansion of heavy industry in the Soviet Union in the 1920s, the argument theorized as primitive socialist accumulation. According to Priyo Prezhensky, in the absence of significant accumulation in the state economy, with a proportionately faster accumulation in the sphere of heavy industry at the expense of the economy as a whole, the inevitable result would be shortages known as the goods famine, because peasant demand was rising as agriculture improved while state output of industrial goods was lagging. 
Given the backwardness of the Soviet economy, however, he argued, there were definite limits to what he called socialist accumulation as such. In other words, definite limits to the addition to the means of production of a surplus product which has been created within the constituted socialist economy. Accordingly, Priyoprochensky argued, primitive socialist accumulation was essential. Quote, accumulation in the hands of the state of material resources, mainly or partly for sources lying outside the complex of the state economy must play an extremely important part in a backward peasant economy, country, he said. Indeed, his fundamental law of primitive accumulation stated that, quote, the more backward economically petty bourgeois peasant a particular country is which has gone over to the socialist organization of production, the more that socialist accumulation is obliged, quote, to rely on alienating part of the surplus product of the pre-socialist forms of economy." Close quote. But could the peasants pay for this primitive socialist accumulation? Priyo Przezinski had no doubt that he could. In a 1925 article on the goods famine, he argued that the source of the current excess demand was the result of the changes that had occurred since the revolution. In Tsarist Russia, he said, peasants were forced to market their output without getting an equivalent return because they had to cover three requirements, central and local taxes, rental payments, and usurious interest charges to kulaks, landholders, landholders, etc. But these requirements were now gone. And now, peasants had more economic freedom to decide when they would sell their surpluses and were in no hurry to sell grain. There was, quote, increased rural consumption of foodstuffs, and most important, there was a, quote, increase in the peasants' effective demand for industrial commodities and products within peasant exchange. Close quote. Very simply, Priyos Bredensky said, what's our problem? Quote, our current goods famine is the result of the positive changes in the structure of the peasant budget that have been affected by our October Revolution. Close quote. So, yes, there was room, he said, in the peasant budget to extract the surpluses from the peasants. The peasants, especially the rich ones, the kulaks, had money. The undersupply of industrial commodities, he said, meant that the peasants, quote, received more money than they could spend. And when there is a goods famine, that is our particular situation, when there is insufficient socialist accumulation in industry, when they have unused money surpluses and their unsold grain is being eaten by mice, the appropriation of a couple hundred million from the reserves of peasant accumulation for the development of industry will, of course, give rise to certain discontent. Close quote. Yes, there would be discontent, but that appropriation, Priyoprochensky argued, would create the material conditions for ending that discontent. To build socialist industry, he called that you know, we have to oust the other economic forms, subordinate them to the new form. And that, he said, would take place through unequal exchange and taxation. The question, the important question, though, is did Priyo Brzezinski understand the peasant economy? For Lenin, in 1922, the theses on policies for the countryside that Priyo Brzezinski prepared for the 11th Party Congress were clearly unsuitable. Lenin described those theses as abstract, filled with pious wishes and assumptions unsupported by facts. They were, quote, ultra and super academic and characteristic of, quote, the intelligentsia of the study circle and the literature, close quote. What those theses lacked, Lenin argued, was knowledge of practical experience and in their place was self-delusion and, quote, false communist self-adulation, which, quote, unnecessarily irritates and offends the peasants, close quote. Now, Lenin's comments on Priyo Pujensky's thesis occur in 1922, one year into the new economic policy, a policy which was aimed at restoring peasant agriculture after the chaos created by the forced re requisition you know, of grain during the Civil War, and, which, and that policy of NEP had the specific purpose of building the link with the peasant masses by convincing them by deeds that the proletarian state supported them. But from the outset, Priyo Prigensky worried about NEP. In his 1921 essay, The Outlook for the New Economic Policy, he stressed that the new policy means freedom, quote, freedom to enrich oneself, 
to accumulate and to employ wage labor in both urban and rural petty production, close quote. Thus, he continued, both the evolution of a capitalist farmer class, a process that had been interrupted by the revolution, will begin anew, end of quote. Already in 1921, the very year that NEP was introduced, Kriopraszewski warned that, quote, the main forces of the counter-revolution are taking shape in the countryside, close quote. And indeed, in a historical fantasy, Priyo also wrote in 1921, called From the New Economic Policy to Socialism, he predicted from the vantage point of a train worker who was also a professor, the breakdown of the, the uh, division of labor, he predicted that NEP had strengthened capitalist forces more rapidly than socialist construction in the first half of the NEP decade. And the result, Priyo historian told, was the bourgeois kulak counter-revolution. Nevertheless, he continued, the defeat of the revolt of NEP against the proletarian dictatorship made greater possible moves towards socialism. In short, without an ounce of historical experience, Priyo Brzezinski already had concluded that the kulak was an imminent counter-revolutionary threat. That was the position he brought to the left opposition and it was the view of this period subsequently endorsed by Trotsky's comment in The Revolution Betrayed that, quote, the peasantry was becoming polarized between the small capitalists on one side and the hired hand on the other, end of quote. If there's anything indisputable from historical studies, it is that the presence, weight, and threat of the kulak within them was vastly, in the 20s, was vastly exaggerated. Of course, there are always rich and poor peasants in the villages. But among the perhaps 3% who were classified as kulaks, only a minority of them owned three to four cows and two to three horses. Further, since the designation of the kulak was based on the ownership of work animals, tools, or land, that designation should not be confused with the Marxian concept of a capitalist, which presumes dependence upon the exploitation of wage laborers for the purpose of exchange. Only 1% of farms employed more than one paid worker, and of the 1.6 million workers who were hired for at least a month by individual peasants in 1927, quote, almost 29% were children up to 15 years working as nursemaids or herdsmen, close quote. This is from a study by Stephen Merle. Only 51% were adults. Now we also have to ask, who hired the wage laborers? Well, those who hired a permanent worker had a family size roughly half the size of the average peasant household. And that suggests it was the lack of family labor that led many of these households to employ a permanent worker. Why else was the share, why else were 25% of these households headed by women, mostly widows? Why else was the share of the old in these households significantly above the average? You know, in fact, according to Merle, the share of households relying predominantly on hired labor, quote, was statistically insignificant in 1927. And he continued, there is virtually no evidence of a trend toward capitalist differentiation of the peasantry defined in terms of the employment of labor, close quote. The most important thing to point to grasp about the Soviet countryside, in short, is that the overwhelming proportion of peasant households relied exclusively upon family labor for their production and reproduction. Thus, the dominant productive relation within these families was oriented toward the need to reproduce the conditions of existence of those within the household, including young children and the aged. These peasant households produced their own subsistence directly from agriculture and secured money income from the sale of agricultural products, but also by sending family members to work outside the farm. And that latter option was quite significant because it permitted families to maintain themselves in face of difficulties in agriculture. In 1925-26, the average annual per capita money income for an industrial worker was 291 rubles. That was higher than the average per capita money income of 246 rubles received by the rich farmer, the Kulak. Indeed, Mark Harrison estimated that, quote, in 1928, the farm population was very much dependent for maintenance of its living standards upon non-agricultural incomes, close quote. To understand the peasants, furthermore, it's essential to recognize they did not exist in isolation. 
Their productive activity took place in villages characterized in large part by strip farming, which meant the intermingling of their holdings. These were villages where the dominant institution was the village commune, the mir, and where there was periodic redistribution of land among households. In other words, where property rights to the land resided in the village commune. The mir, indeed, was a key part of the relations of production of these families. According to Marx, when he looked at the mir in the 1880s, he said, an inner dualism characterizes that mir. He said, it's a combination of common land ownership and individual product of activity where each peasant cultivates and works his plot, reaps the fruits of his field on his own account. And Marx said, while this latter element is fragmented labor as the source of private appropriation, potentially could introduce heterogeneous elements into the commune, provoking conflicts of interest and passion, likely to break up the cultivated land and then forests, pastures, etc. Marx did not view the disintegration of the commune as inevitable. On the contrary, he said, its innate dualism admits of an alternative. Either its property element will gain the upper hand over its collective element, or else the reverse will take place. Everything depends on the historical context in which it is located. And it's, close quote. And in fact, Marx concluded at the time when he was writing, these are his letters to Vera Sazulich, uh, he, he concluded at the time, quote, what threatens the life of the Russian commune is neither a historical inevitability nor a theory. It is state oppression and exploitation by capitalist intruders whom the state has made powerful at the peasant's expense, close quote. In short, the historical context in which the mere existed at that time that Marx wrote was one of contested reproduction. The reproduction of the mere was under attack by the combination of the exactions of the state and the encroachments of capitalist relations. Nevertheless, in the period following Marx's observation, the mere proved very strong and hardy. Despite Premier Stoyipin's 1907 attempt to establish small peasant farms with privately owned land in place of the commune, which is a political effort which demonstrated that there was no spon significant spontaneous process of dis disintegration of the commune, you know, quote, relatively few peasants wanted to separate. In other words, the actions of the Tsar state did not succeed in vanquishing the mirror. And then came the Soviet Revolution. The Soviet Revolution created an entirely new historical context for the mirror. The existing enemies of the mirror were defeated. Indeed, the village communes were the key actors in the revolutionary confiscation and redistribution of the land of the gentry. In the process, the commune spread into regions such as the Ukraine, where it had been previously unknown, and private parcels of land that had been separated under the Stoyipin reforms were returned to the mere. By 1927, an estimated 95.5% of peasant holdings fell within communal ownership. The result, in short, was a considerable strengthening of the mere. Harrison made the comment, quote, in the course of the appropriation of the landlord estates and reabsorption of Stolypin's farm farmsteads into the old open field system, the repartitional village commune revived and became more active and more widespread among the peasantry than at any time since 1861. Indeed, with the destruction of the old centralized political bureaucracy, the political self-determination of the village predominated. And that strengthened Mir is the context in which to consider the tendency toward socioeconomic differentiation under the Mir. Not only the partitioning of households among sons, which was the role meant that large farms then appeared as many small farms, uh, but also the redistribution of land within the commune meant a general leveling of land holdings. The number of households increased from 21 million in 1916 to 22.8 million in 1923 to 25 million in 1927, and average family size was, was stable, and so you see rural population was growing, and equality in the villages increased. Indeed, the level of differentiation among households on the basis of size of farms was less in 1927 than in 1913. By its very nature, the mir tended to maintain and protect the status quo within the village. In other words, to reproduce the condition of existence of those peasant households. 
Indeed, as Stolypin had recognized after 1905, the mere was the enemy of capitalist relations of production. In short, there was contested reproduction between two sets of productive relations in the Soviet economy in the 1920s, but not a war between capitalism and socialism, and between the regulating principles, respectively, of the law of value and primitive socialist accumulation. Rather, the essential conflict was the struggle between the simple reproduction of peasant households within the mere and the expanded reproduction of state industry under vanguard relations of production. To stress the law of value is to think of peasant households as capitalist firms. But unlike capitalist enterprises, they were not dependent upon the market and thus the law of value for their existence. These households produce a substantial part of their own subsistence and remove themselves from the market in whole or in part when that appeared rational. Production for exchange was a means for reproduction, not the basis of their existence as it is for capitalist firms. Consider then the interaction between these two existing sets of productive relations. Faced with the acceleration of efforts to expand industry at the expense of agriculture from the time of the mid-20s, peasants responded rationally. Although the standard explanation is that the Kulak, through his gain, grain strike, created the crisis which strengthened the revolution, few things are simpler to explain than the shortage of grain available to the state. The lack of forced sales, the leveling that had occurred in the countryside in the 1920s, and the increased rural population, which consumed an additional 1.5 million tons of grain compared to the pre-war period, and immediately, very significantly, the 20 to 25 percent reduction in the price of grain by state procurement agencies. All of that contributed substantially to a fall in the amount of grain marketed. Very simply, as one writer Wheatcroft noted, quote, the attempts of the government to control and hold down grain prices naturally increased the attractiveness of converting grain surpluses to livestock whose value could be realized on a less restricted private market. Thus, close quote, thus while net, gra net grain production was 35 below 1913 levels in 1928, and marketed grain production was 58 percent below the, you know, the 1913 levels, net production of industrial crops was up 41 percent, and net livestock production was up 25 percent, although here too marketed output was below, in the case of uh, livestock, below 1913 levels. There is no question that expanded reproduction of state industry was limited by the peasants' ability to shift production and marketing in response to the state's attempt to extract resources by paying low prices for purchases. Similarly, as the scissors crisis of 1923 had demonstrated, peasant response to price increases of state products limited the revenue, they went on strike, they refused to buy those state products, limited the revenues of state industries and thus reproduction. On the other side, development of productive forces in agriculture was limited by the uncertainty produced by frequent price changes and the not at all distant memory of the forced requisitions and attacks upon improving peasants of a few years earlier. The interaction of these two sets of productive relations was dysfunctional. There was an option, at least in theory. Real emphasis upon the development of cooperatives in agriculture could have built upon the collective property side of that innate dualism of the mirror that Marx identified. By, beginning, by the beginning of 1923, in fact, Lenin had concluded that a concerted attempt to build cooperatives at, you know, was, in agriculture was essential. Quote, we lost sight of the cooperatives, he said, when NEP was introduced. With political power in the hands of the working class and ownership of the means of production, Lenin argued, quote, the only task indeed that remains for us is to organize the population in cooperative societies. Indeed, and Lenin insisted, this is in his work on cooperation, and insisted, quote, if the whole of the peasantry had been organized in cooperatives, we would by now have been standing with both feet on the soil of socialism, close quote. Accordingly, Lenin stressed the importance of finding ways to encourage peasants to join cooperatives. Quote, we must find what form of bonus to give for joining the cooperatives and the terms on which we should give it. The form of bonus by which we will assist the cooperative su sufficiently, the bonus that will produce the civilized cooperator, close quote. Lenin's conclusion that the growth of cooperation under these new circumstances was 
quote, identical with the growth of socialism, close quote, marked a significant shift in his position. Quote, we have to admit that there has been a radical modification in our whole outlook on socialism, close quote. That's a pretty significant statement. Educational and organizational work among peasants was key, which meant organizing peasants in cooperatives. Another aspect of that same shift was his rejection in the same month, this is in a work called Our Revolution, of what Lenin called pedantic Marxism and its, quote, incontrovertible proposition, close quote, learned by rote repetition from West European social democracy that, quote, the objective economic premises for socialism do not exist in our country, end of quote. Lenin said, that is pedantic Marxism. Of course, encouraging peasants to join cooperatives could only be the beginning of a process that would take a whole historical epoch. Yet given the existence of strip farming, you know, strips of farming, medieval farming, and you know, the fact that as many as five and a half million peasant households were still relying upon wooden plows, significant gains in agricultural productivity were possible that did not re require major advances in industrialization. By taxing indep independent peasants and subsidizing those who joined cooperatives, in other words, by using the state to change relations within the countryside, agriculture could have been this come the site of new productive relations, of emerging socialist relations, which could be the basis for development of productive forces. This would have been the real analogy to Marx's discussion of the original accumulation of capitalist relations, which originated in agriculture in England, rather than the idea of the maximum, maximum extraction for agriculture for the benefit of industry. That was definitely not the perspective, this perspective that Lenin had of Priya Pekinsky. Nor indeed was it the perspective of his theoretical po opponents like Pekarin, whose main issue of contention was over how much to extract. In other words, a quantitative rather than a qualitative difference. For Priya Pekinsky, using the state to build new productive relations within agriculture had to wait until the period quote, until the period of primitive socialist accumulation is completed, close quote. Only when productive forces are developed can you change the relations of production. Only when, quote, industry stands on a new technical foundation, he argued, can we provide that, quote, aid to cooperation of which Lenin spoke, close quote. In Priyo Prozhensky's misnamed analogy, now was the time for peasants to wait. Now is the time for the maximum primitive socialist accumulation, that's all in quotes, the maximum extent to which industry could expand at the expense of agriculture. Now in fact, failure to understand the importance of work with peasants meant there was little attention to the development of cooperatives in the countryside. And as a result, dysfunction and impasse was the product of the interaction between the expanded reproduction of state industry under vanguard relations and the simple reproduction of peasant households within the mere. The historical outcome of this interaction is certainly well known. The shortage of marketed grain in 1927, the left opposition's demand for seizure, um, unsuccessful demand for seizure of grain from the kulaks and prosperous middle peasants, the subsequent adoption of those very measures by Stalin at the end of 1927, the grain shortages which followed, and the push for rapid collectivization in agriculture in 1929. In the end, the resolution to the impasse created by contested reproduction was force. The resolution did not create socialist relations in the countryside, and it certainly destroyed productive forces in agriculture in the process. However, the vanguard state achieved what the Tsarist state had failed to do, destruction of the mirror. Thus, it eliminated that economic form which had been limiting the operation of the law of primitive socialist accumulation. Forced collectivization as a method was not the gradual elimination that Priyo Pujensi had expected, but it was implicit in his argument for the maximum extraction from agriculture for the benefit of industry. Force. Force, Marx pointed out, is the midwife of every society which is pregnant with a new one. That force, which that's from primitive accumulation section, that force, which can range from legal actions through the state to, quote, ruthless terrorism, end of quote, and bloody brute force, needs to be considered in the context of contested reproduction. 
Although contested reproduction may generate dysfunction and deformation, force in some form as a midwife is necessary when the old does not disappear spontaneously and instead finds ways to reproduce itself. In such cases, the particular methods employed to bring about that birth will depend on how difficult the birth is. For example, Marx indicated that centuries were required before workers to agree to sell their labor power voluntarily. And once they did, their ability to extract themselves from the status of wage labor when wages were high enough meant that there was a tendency for the non-reproduction of wage labor and therefore the definite limits to the reproduction of capitalist relations of production. So it was essential in this context that wages be kept down in order to prevent this non-reproduction. And as Marx noted, quote, the rising bourgeoisie, bourgeoisie needs the power of the state and uses it to regulate wages, close quote. Force. Force enters into this question when contested reproduction generates an impasse. Force, to destroy the mirror and allow the vanguard state to collect the grain. That's what collectivization is, let's collect. You know, to collect the grain without the limits imposed by the mirror. Force, to allow the expansion of capitalist relations on land to which peasant, Chinese peasants have traditional rights. Force, to attack capitalist relations through revolution in the Soviet Union, China, Yugoslavia, Vietnam, and Cuba. Force, to remove the barriers to capitalism by removing Gorbachev and ending the Soviet Union. This is force at midwife. Recall, though, that contested reproduction is two-sided. And force in some of these cases can be seen from another side. It can be seen not as a beginning, but as an ending. An ending of particular characteristics. For example, the end to real socialism was an end to the social contract, an end to job rights for workers, to subsidize necessities, and to a focus on any social needs. From that side, force is best seen not as a midwife, but as a surgeon. Indeed, I suggest that most uses of force that we see about us are best understood from this perspective. Force is the surgeon that removes cancer from a threatened body. Rather than the means by which the new is born, it is the means for the reproduction of the old. Fascism was the use of force to remove the inroads made by the working class in capitalism, inroads which brought with them morbid symptoms in the functioning of capitalism. So too military authoritarianism as in Chile under Pinochet. So too the attack on air traffic controllers and the subsequent assault on the working class in the United States. So too force in the form of IMF conditionality to remove self-management in the former Yugoslavia. Privatization, imposed austerity, indeed the entire neoliberal project has as its goal not the creation of the new but the preservation of the old by removing disturbing elements, including, of course, all that was inherited from social democracy, real socialism, and self-management. Whereas the concept of primitive accumulation often elevates particular methods, ahistorical forms of force, the concept of contested reproduction directs us necessarily to consider not methods, but the nature of specific relations of production and the struggle between the logic of different classes. In doing that, it allows us to focus on the advances that were achieved through past struggles and which capital is attempting to surgically remove. People are struggling against the ta attacks on what they have come to think of as fair and just. And this is the necessary starting point for revolutionaries. To the starting point is the set of no social norms and beliefs as to what is right and wrong, the moral economy of the working class. As Marx knew, though, Struggles based upon existing concepts of fairness, such as a fair day's wage for a fair day's work, are necessary, but essentially attempts to restore the old norms, attempts to return to the good old days. It was necessary, Marx argued, to go beyond that moral economy of the working class to the political economy of the working class. In short, to go beyond those conservative slogans to the revolutionary slogan, abolition of the capitalist relation. Thus, we begin by stressing capital's current use of force as a surgeon. We begin with what people understand as unfairness and injustice, and we need to build from there to convince them of the necessity of force as the midwife for the birth of a new society. For that essential step, though, we need the vision of that new society. 
the vision of socialism as an organic system, and we need to show how that future is implicit in the struggles of the present. People need a vision if they are to move from their current resistance and guerrilla wars against capital. Let me suggest that there is a vision that has emerged in the 21st century. It's a vision of a socialist alternative to both capitalism and real socialism. It's a concept of socialism as an organic system. Socialism as a particular combination of production, distribution, and consumption. Social ownership of the means of production, social production organized by workers, and production for social needs and purposes. This concept of socialism as an organic system, which President Chavez of Venezuela called the elementary socialist triangle, points to the necessity to struggle on all three sides at once. It points to the error of putting off some sides until some great day in the future when productive forces have developed enough, which is the position of, was the position of Priyo Prezhensky, but also China, and every, every sign of vulgar, what I call vanguard Marxism, you know, everywhere is the development of the productive force comes first. Uh, rather, the concept of socialism as an organic system points to the need to struggle simultaneously for workers' control and the creation of local committees of solidarity uh, to attempt to build and expand a new commons, and you know, all of which are occurring in Venezuela now. By making explicit the characteristics of this particular combination, it can be a weapon in struggle. And that is why Chavez's call to reinvent socialism in his closing speech in January 2005 at the World Social Forum in Porto Alegre, Brazil, was so significant. We must reinvent socialism, Chavez said. It can't be the kind of socialism that we saw in the Soviet Union, he stressed. But it will emerge as we develop new systems that are based on cooperation, not competition. If we are ever going to end the poverty of the majority of the world, capitalism must be transcended. But he continued, quote, but we cannot resort to state capitalism, which would be the same perversion of the Soviet Union. We must reclaim socialism as a thesis, a project, and a path, but a new type of socialism, a humanist one, which puts humans and not machines or the state ahead of everything, close quote. That speech pointed, in short, to a different concept, a vision of socialism for the 21st century. Rather than expansion of the means of production or direction by the state, it asserted that human beings must be at the center of the new socialist society. That perspective reveals a return to Marx's vision, to the contrast that Marx drew in capital between a society subordinate to the logic of capital, where, quote, the worker exists to satisfy the need of existing values for valorization, close quote, and the logic of a new society, quote, that inverse situation in which objective wealth is there to satisfy the worker's own need for development, close quote. There is more, though, to, this, to the core of this concept of socialism for the 21st century. It is also a return to Marx's understanding that human development requires practice to his understanding of the centrality of revolutionary practice, that concept of the coinciding, the coincidence of the changing of circumstances and of human activity or self-change, close quote. With the grasping of Marx's key link of human development and practice, this concept of socialism for the 21st century emphasizes, emphasizes our need to develop through democratic, participatory, and protagonistic activity in every aspect of our lives. Demo this concept is one of democracy in practice, democracy as practice, democracy as protagonism. Democracy in this sense, protagonist democracy in the workplace, protagonistic democracy in neighborhoods, communities, communes, is the democracy of people who transform themselves into revolutionary subjects. Having a conception of socialism as an organic system concept of its being allows us to think seriously about the processes of its becoming. Not abstractly, but with the recognition that this necessarily involves a process of contested reproduction, and that the necessary methods to realize that society are always, as always, contingent. How you get there is contingent, but what is 
not contingent, I would suggest, is that if you don't know where you want to go, no road will take you there. So that's my Hegelian circle. <laughs> the excellent lecture. I don't think we will have any problems continuing this debate. And comrades, now it's your opportunity to raise questions, give comments. As usual, the comrades on both sides of the tribune are available for the mic, so just raise your hand and pose questions. Yes, please, Mark. Just a short comment, uh, a corollary to your, uh, to your uh, lecture. Uh, and a sort of a reflection on uh, Lenin's uh, intellectual history and uh, intellectual history of uh, Leninism and Marxism. Uh, it seems to me you have, it is clear that you have presented uh, two views on the Soviet agriculture and the peasantry. And the one uh, which you attributed to Preobrazhensky might as well, I think, be attributed to Lenin and the, uh, to Lenin in the late 19th century. And the other one, uh, which has been confirmed by the analysis of uh, agrarian and economic historians, which you quote, uh, is the one that can be attributed to uh, Russian, uh, Russian Soviet uh, agrarian economist uh, Alexander Chayanov. Uh, because, uh, to put it very simply, uh, in his uh, book on the development of uh, uh, capitalism in Russia, uh, Lenin uh, was actually um, an advocate of, uh, of, uh, of a theory which you described uh, as uh, Preobrazhensky's theory. This is uh, the theory that states that uh, the main driving force uh, of uh, the social changes happening in the Soviet agriculture, uh, in the Russian uh, agriculture and the peasantry sector, is uh, capitalist differentiation between uh, large peasants or kulaks who act as uh, sort of capitalists. Uh, and polarization of kulaks on one hand and uh, uh, peasantry, proletarian, uh, proletarianized peasants uh, without uh, serious uh, holdings to support themselves. And the middle class, the, the, middle, uh, the middle peasantry is, was actually vanishing in that process. Now this was Lenin's thesis and it's probably quite close to Kowski's thesis. thesis. Uh, whereas uh, Chayano, who was making actual uh, empirical research on the matter, uh, thought that the actual process was the one which you have described and uh, the historians that you quote have confirmed, uh, which is a sort of a demographic differentiation. Uh, it is differentiation uh, uh, which uh, follows the life cycle of, uh, of uh, peasantry households. Uh, you have a small family which have small holdings, but maybe holdings which are large enough to employ additional labor because the labor of the family is not enough. So. Um, what I'm saying is uh, simply, okay, you have here uh, two views on, uh, on the, the developments of the Soviet or uh, Russian peasantry and uh, agricultural sector. And I would say that uh, as far as I'm concerned, and uh, it is being confirmed by the research that you have quoted, uh, the actual picture was the second one. And uh, to conclude, uh, I think it's, it is not a coincidence that uh, on the Lenin's deathbed or beside it, there were books of, of Chayano actually. So I think that Lenin was coming, was uh, actually criticizing his old position um, in view of uh, the actual uh, development of Soviet uh, and Russian agriculture uh, in the direction of, of Chayano's. So it would be very, uh, I think it's worthwhile to take uh, Chayano's works uh, when we consider these processes. Uh, just a, a quick comment, you know, Chayano knew more about uh, what was happening in agriculture uh, than Lenin and most Bolsheviks, who were urban boys, the city boys for the most part. Um, and he and his colleagues at the uh, Agricultural Institute um, studied very carefully peasant villages, and among these early findings was that many of these large farms were subsequently go back to the same village years later, a few years later, and see that they were now divided up among the sons. You know, so there were now small farms, the, you know, and by the definite, that strange definition of kulak, 
which had nothing to do with a capitalist employer, you know, that meant the kulak has disappeared. You know, so, um, but unfortunately, China also disappeared um, after, and when he was accused, along with the other members of the Agricultural Institute, like Kondrani, <coughs> uh, of being part of the Toiling Peasants Party conspiracy in 1930. Yeah? Yeah, can I um, say that, uh, thank you very much for a very, very interesting uh, lecture. Uh, I think, uh, I would have just added to it that Lenin was also turning his back on uh, his early work on the uh, on capital accumulation uh, or, or the, the possibility of capitalist development in uh, uh, in uh, Russia, which wasn't actually published until after he had died, where he uh, where he was concerned with this problem of uh, the, the the limited the, the, the constraints on capitalist development, and which were, to, which were then to lead to this, the, uh, what effectively happened, which is that it had to be done under, uh, 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 under the Bolsheviks. Um, but I think you, uh, uh, you, you uh, the, 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 the problem with NEP uh, was also uh, one that, while it, it, was, it was good for stabilizing, uh, the economy stabilizing production uh, following a period of uh, uh, war communism. Uh, there was also a problem in the first place that, that it, it led to price instability and the famous scissors crisis uh, uh, that occurred at the time. But uh, also, it never actually solved the problem of, uh, uh, of development or the problem the, the, the Problem of the working class, namely that of unemployment. So unemployment uh, uh, emerges and continues right up until the five-year plans. And Stalin uh, introduces the five-year plans. So that there's, uh, in a sense, the uh, that that uh, that whole situation um, uh, uh, of NEP, uh, which you say, well, this was a. a, a, a this was a period in which there was mutual development. Actually, it, 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 that development uh, was limited, and, I, I, and uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, it required uh, some kind of uh, change. You know, that change came in the, in the form of five-year plans, which I agree with you were. Uh, 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 you, you know, this, this was forced industrialization, and it was, uh, 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 it, it was not a... Uh, 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 really just exacerbated all, all, all the problems. But there were problems there. Uh, let me just say that I, I doubt there are problems. I addressed only one question, which was, was capitalism emerging in the countryside and was it a threat to the regime? And I have to say no. Um, there were problems. I don't mean you know, anyone can look at the net, the net men, the middlemen who were functioning between the countryside and and the state industry, um, who were because of the, the lack of real controls over them, uh, you know, not only um, amassing money, but also at the same time their the their existence was undermining confidence of people. So I mean, there was an ideological effect of that. Um, and, but simply, to, I simply want to stress that Priyoprzhensky's argument has nothing to do with Marx's argument because it's not talking about a change in the relations, uh, you know, and certainly, um, and that this idea of maximum extraction, which was his idea fix, you know, is, is not different from what ultimately happens with the whole process of collectivization, which destroyed farm animals. It wasn't until the 1950s they brought them up to, this, to the level that had been lost. Uh, and, you know, because peasants consume uh, at the time rather than you know go under these conditions. Uh, and I also wouldn't say that it, that there was a that it was wrong to try to industrialize rapidly. Whether this was the best way to do it is another question. And not because capitalism was a threat internally, but <coughs> imperialism. Imperialism was out there from 1927. It became visible with, with the British, the links with the, the British. And certainly, you know, and if that, anything that Stalin ever said to say you rung true, it was a speech in 1931 when he says, we're 50 years behind, we have 10 years to make it up, 
is 1920-31, or we go, we'll be defeated again. We must do it. We cannot slow the tempo. Uh, that was a particular good prediction on, on Stalin's part. Okay. More questions and comments? <clears throat> yes. Socialism, 
I look at the way in which the managers and their experts, etc., emerge as a, an emerging, you know, capitalist class, um, which is constrained by a whole series of things, by you know, as a result of the logic of the vanguard. And the whole thrust then is their attempt to free themselves from this constraints, and they, but in that process there is a, a great dysfunction. Now, in the case, I, I make a distinction between the countries of real socialism and the Yugoslav market self-management case, uh, precisely because there was, a, you know, s significant differences were introduced in 1950 and 1951. Um, and here again, I would say we have to examine the relations of production that occurred in those enterprises. And it's not, you know, years of education can allow you to be an artist, can allow you to be a scientist, etc. That does not place you in a particular productive relation. So that is, I think, where I would distinguish my, what I'm saying from what you're saying. But anyway, there might be some other questions. Yes. Okay, I have one question. You, you made a really meticulous presentation of the land reform in the former Soviet Union, uh, but I would like to ask you, uh, since you spent so many years in Venezuela, if you could focus on the land reform uh, in Venezuela for a while, and uh, perhaps by using the same concepts uh, of primitive socialist accumulation and contested reproduction, how do you see the land reform in Venezuela? What, what difficulties do you see or what successes? Well, I'm not an expert on, on land reform in, in Venezuela. Uh, one of the first things you have to recognize is, you know, how few peasants there are in Venezuela uh, because uh, the attraction of the city, the difficulties of what was called the Dutch disease, etc., like that, you know, meant that food imports came from out, food was imported rather than produced locally. So you have a, a lot of people living in the barrios, living on the hills, etc., outside the major cities. Uh, who come from the countryside. Uh, then you also have the accumulation of vast amounts of land, uh, the latifundia, uh, a portion of which, you know, nobody could trace their legal status. You know, that they were somehow just simply you know, usurped. You know, people just added on. And so one of the most important initial steps was to break up the latifundia, to take the latifundia and to turn it over to peasants. But, you know, there are, so there are peasant cooperatives that are now farming the, you know, the Latifundia lands, uh, in some case, and the product makes changes because a lot of Latifundia, insofar as the land was used, and much wasn't used, was being used for grain, you know, beef, et cetera, like that, where the peasants are growing food which they themselves eat and which is for local consumption. Um, there is, um, but also, and then there are the socialist communes that have been established, you know, as on all the seized land. But really, one of the main problems is there, you know, there's not enough people in the countryside to produce, you know, what what the country needs, and still importing a very substantial part of its of its, uh, you know, food re requirements. Now that doesn't mean production hasn't increased; it's increased, but so also has consumption because of the rising standards of living of people in Venezuela. Uh, so one of the things I found very interesting when you watched uh, Chavez, you know, all the presidentes. You know the Sunday, you know, uh, teaching. Uh, you know what, what you what you would see was a situation in which so many of them were located at socialist communes in successful cooperatives, and they show here are the buildings in which people are living, and here are the you know, what they're able to do the standard of living. And I, I I don't know this for a fact, but I always strongly suspect that this was an attempt to create conditions in which young people living in horrible situations in poverty in, in, the, you know, in the worst barrios would be attracted to thinking that would be a nice place to start a family, uh, you know, rather than where, where we are. I know that happens in, in you know, uh, the MST in, in Brazil, does it, makes land available to young couples to start, you know, to be able to have family. And Chavez himself also tried to create direct links between you know neighborhoods, certain neighborhoods like Patari, you know, and the socialist communes to try to establish you know some links which might lead somewhere. But I think one of the real problems is that they, they need to you know develop agriculture. And they you know they've had it, it's a different kind of potentially a different kind of model, not like the Soviet model of agriculture to serve industry, you know, uh, but the possibility of oil to serve agriculture. Okay. Yes, up okay. there. Oh, I'm 
bit similar question to the last maybe. Uh, do you see uh, MIR uh, as appropriate set of uh, relationships uh, for the social, this uh, organic socialism of the 21st century? You personally, do you see that as it would be, it could be socialist? Do I think yes. MIR is a model? Yeah. Uh, no. I think every country has its own model out of its own historic traditions. In Russia, the Mir was the historic tradition. Um, in Latin America, there are peasant communities that you know can be built upon, which don't have the precise kinds of characteristics of the Mir. But the point is, you 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 don't go with your theory and your model and sort of you know violently change things. You have to build things organically from within the country. <coughs> Did I understand you correctly that you see actually Mir as contributing to the socialism in Russia at that time? Mm. Or not? No, I I I could you repeat the question? Okay. Did I understand that you sort of by describing Mir saw that it was that it was contributing to the socialism, uh, the the Mir itself? I think that you start, the mirror existed. The mirror was this process of, you know, of, of maintaining the, the conditions of existence of the existing peasant. But the mirror was inefficient in the sense that they were strip farming. Uh, you, know, that, that, you know, that was a potential problem. But some of the kinds of things that Chayanov, the agricultural economist, was proposing was the idea of forms of cooperation that could be introduced, not necessarily, but not exclusive, not exclusive of, cooperation like horizontal cooperation, but vertical cooperation. The mirror, after all, for example, owned the marketplace in every village. The, that was common property. It belonged to no one, no one had a design. But there was also the possibility of having processing, which was commonly owned you know, by the village, and various other forms of developing a process, a process of you know, encroaching cooperation and, and a new kind of forms of, of, of you know, uh, relations among people within the mirror that would in fact do exactly what Marx was saying, strengthening the collective element. So I think that it was possible to build on that. Not easy, but what's easy? <laughs> okay, any more questions? Got it? Hello. Uh, I just immediately found, once you start developing, the concept of contested reproduction useful because it can be reapplied. It's very generic. Uh, at least that's how I got the message when you uh, when you developed it. But one perhaps provocative question: you were quite critical about the vanguard mode of uh, reproduction, as you called it, or leadership in, in uh, the vanguard mode. In your last book, you were very uh, critical of it, and in detail you developed it through your reading quite rightly, but to be, to provoke you a bit, uh, would have Venezuela been better if they had been more vanguard mentality? For example, you're saying about, you know, you make young couples go to, uh, or in Brazil, you know, encouraging young couples to go to uh, the land just to develop agriculture. I mean, would it not develop a lot faster if they just did it with the vanguard model, with the state developing companies that will just go and you know, import technology and just develop? I mean, is that, I understand ideologically for Chavez it was unacceptable from what I know, uh, but this is strictly, you know, speaking in terms of uh, mentality of catching up, of mentality, or kind of, you know, pure growth model, which does not consider the socialist side of, from everyone according to their ability. So would it, you know, would focusing on, on only meeting the needs in a raw developmental model have been better for Venezuela and similar countries? Can they afford to go the path that they are using? Well, let me just uh, clarify, you know, at least one point. When I talk about the problem of vanguard and vanguard relations and vanguard mode of production, I'm talking about a concept which involves, you know, the idea that the vanguard knows everything. It's the, it is, you know, it is like the orchestra conductor, which alone has the whole picture, in contrast to those 
little players who only know their own part. Uh, there's a wonderful passage from Elias Kinetic, you know, uh, in his book Crowds and Power, talking about there's no greater symbol of power than the than the uh, orchestra conductor, uh, and that is the uh, that's where the title conductor and the conducted comes from. Because the characteristic is that the vanguard, you know, it, in its own conception believes that it cannot allow spontaneity from below. Uh, it must direct everything. It must control everything. Now, I distinguish between that and leadership. Leadership is different than the, that particular concept of the vanguard. So leadership, you know, a number of years ago, in fact, when I first wrote in this area an article uh, which was in Socialist Register called The Socialist Fetter, um, and um, in that I, I sort of was raising the whole question of the importance of human development, the importance of practice, et cetera, like that, and I gave it to a Cuban friend. Um, and he, a very smart guy, and he looked at it and he just said, but Michael, what's the role of the vanguard then? And I said, the role of the vanguard is to create the conditions in which people can develop themselves. You know, um, and that's different from the concept of the vanguard that has been inherited. So, you know, when you say that, when we talk about, say, Venezuela, Chavez showed leadership. But Chavez, in his leadership, we, we would not have had you know, in Venezuela, the idea of the communal councils, you know, developing, without Chavez saying, we must have a law on communal councils in which the following things will occur, et cetera, like that. You know, we would, but then, he said, then the people will develop through this process. And then he quite regularly said, the communes, the communal councils are the cells of a new socialist state. It was leadership there, not the vanguard relation. Okay, Tibor is next. Uh, you may have covered this already in your talk, uh, but I'm sorry, I missed a lot of it. Um, uh, what do you think, what's your take on Paris Chattopadhyay's uh, theory of state capitalism as developed in his book, uh, The Marxian Concept of Capital um, and, uh, and the Soviet Experience? You'll have to repeat that. I, I, I'm, I'm having trouble with okay. the clarity of what comes through the microphone. Okay, of course. Uh, Paras Chattopadhyay, you know of him? Paras Chattopadhyay? I don't think so. Uh, Marx, um, I'm, I think you talked about him when Andrew Kleinman was speaking. Uh, he was he was mentioning him. Oh, Parish. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, my accent. Uh, so, you know of his book, The Marxian Concept uh, of Capital and the Soviet Experience, where he develops his theory of state capitalism? Or do you know of his theory of state capitalism? My, you know, I, I think I was trying to suggest this when Andrew gave this talk, and you know, I did it very quickly. I think Parrish is an excellent examiner of the texts. You know, um, but the texts will not tell you what the Soviet Union was. You, know, you have to do concrete analysis, and Parrish does not do it. You know, he just simply does not do it, but he's excellent in excavating things from the texts. That, for me, that's idealism, you know, if you rely simply on that. <laughs> okay, ju just, just a small question. Uh, it's more of a clarification, because uh, as you mentioned, uh, here and also in your book, the main explanation of the real socialisms is that they, are the, they were the systems of contested reproduction of two systems, the vanguard logic and the capitalist logic. Now, when you gave the example of the Mir, uh, you said on the one hand, Mir was a, a, a type of community or, or social phenomenon where exchange was an instrument of reproduction, it didn't serve the accumulation, and on the other hand, the vanguard were the, the ones introducing capitalist logic. They uh, uh, wanted to extract the surplus from the mir, from the from the uh, agriculture, and to use it to build uh, build the uh, in industry. So now the question would be: uh, Isn't this a bit uh, removed, or isn't this in a, a small small contradiction with the, the main explanation? where the vanguard logic is not the capitalist logic. Well, I portrayed the, the contested reproduction in the 20s as a, 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 you know, a struggle between the simple reproduction of the peasant family within the mirror 
versus expanded reproduction of state industry under vanguard relations of production, not capitalist relations. So the idea of expanded reproduction should never be simply assumed to have anything to do with capitalism because it's just, that's just one form. That's expanded reproduction under capitalist relations. This is expanded reproduction under you know, uh, vanguard relations. Now, Priyoprzhensky calls it socialist. You know, uh, I don't see how you can call it socialist when there's one-man management and workers' councils have been effectively destroyed, et cetera. You know, uh, that, for me, is not definable as socialist. So the, the, the accumulation in the socialist accumulation doesn't mean it's not, it is capitalist. The, the accumulation, the notion of accumulation in socialist accumulation doesn't mean it is, it is capitalist. That's right. Yeah. We have, you know, we always start from what are the relations of production we're talking about? You know, are they capitalist relations of production? In other words, is there capital on the one hand, wage labor on the other hand, or is it something else? Any more questions? <coughs> ah, yes. Step back. <coughs> Thank you for your excellent talk. Um, and I think that, um, that this should help to cut through a lot of scholastic debates on, on the left when, when debating the Soviet Union, what was its character, this or that, where each side picks certain aspects and, and then uh, uh, makes the <coughs> argument based on this, uh, rather than understanding it precisely as, as a contested reproduction of, of different modes of production. Uh, and, and as we see, not necessarily exclusively uh, socialism or uh, capitalism, but uh, as you say, manga mode of production and then even the beer, uh, that, that obviously doesn't fall into any of these categories. But so this gives probably a good um, a good um, framework for, for approaching, uh, analyzing any kind of society. So, um, and since Venezuela has already been mentioned, and there are, after Chavez is dead, now we have a new uh, president, so people are asking uh, themselves, on that terrain, there's also uh, a contestation uh, going on, and how do you see maybe the, 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 the rearrangement of the forces now with Maduro as, as president? And how what do you see as the perspectives, uh, which of these contesting most productions, do you see? In Venezuela? Now? Yes, yes. <laughs> I, I, I really can't say. Because um, I, you know, when I was in Venezuela, my main focus and activity was in relationship to worker self-management. So that's where I was, you know, mainly focused on. I, I didn't, I, I know only casually, you know, what was happening in socialist communes and agriculture, etc., like that. So it's, I, I can't really say what kinds of struggles, I mean, one of the struggles happening in the countryside is the attempt of peasant communes to develop and not be assassinated by the hired goons of, of the latifundists. Okay. Yes, yes. Thank you for your talk. While you were talking, I was thinking about a man named Wolf Levijinsky, who was a Ukrainian, called himself a socialist, but mostly an anti-communist, who went to Asia after World War II and promoted land reform, actually imposed land reform because the United States won the war. He imposed land reform in uh, Japan, and in Taiwan, and they kicked him out of the army before he got to South Korea, but his assistant did it to South Korea. And the land reform they had was too small to give the farmers an ability to become full-fledged capitalists, could get them to feed themselves, making wages much cheaper, and seemed to be a major factor in promoting economic development in all of those uh, countries. And I kept thinking about that while you were talking about uh, what you saw in the Soviet Union. So I thought I'd ask you to comment on it. I, I really don't have any comment. I really don't know. You know. 
I don't know the case that you have in mind. Just as an alternative and, approach. And you're the agricultural expert in Belgium. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, any other questions, comments? Yes, uh, you quoted uh, Chavez and uh, his attempt to formulate um, his vision of uh, socialism for the 21st century in Latin America, especially in Venezuela. But uh, Venezuela or Latin America are not really comparable with Europe. And uh, so I would like to ask you, um, can you give us uh, such suggestions, suggestions um, how to um, organize and how to formulate uh, a concept uh, for, the, for the socialism in the 21st century and how to organize. Uh, our comrades from the Workers and Plants University uh, still are on a good way with uh, the initiative um, uh, we heard um, today in the morning. But uh, what would you say um, are the potentials and um, um, the, the organizing uh, structures um, that, that would, us, would us allow to create such um, an organization or organizations uh, who make us able to, to go into the struggles um, that are waiting for us? Not an easy question, but you know what, what I come back to all the time is the necessity of a vision, a goal to work toward. And I've tried in the book The Socialist Alternative, I tried to sort of set that out as this you know uh, triangle of you know social ownership of the means of production, social production organized by workers for the purpose of social needs. And that has definite and, and those three sides, those three aspects intertwine and, and reinforce each other. Um, now, that's a goal, but every country, it, and I'm saying, you have that idea, have that goal, and I, I include in the book, toward the end of the book, what I call a charter for human development, which points out you know, how you can struggle, the kinds of demands that can be made that link up to each of those. Um, now, but basically, in every country, if you have that conception, then you decide yourselves, the only thing I would suggest is you don't sort of go off into a room and decide, well, here is this you know, conception of socialism as a, you know, an organic system. That means we should do A, B, C, et cetera, like that. The starting point, I'm saying, is you have to start with the struggles that people are engaged in, you know, that they are moved by, and to work with them and try to then move in those struggles to transform you know, the perspective from simply trying to return to the good old days to try to build new new things. Okay, Gal is next. Just to pick up on this um, also last point. Uh, on the one hand, thank you, by the way, for the really good lecture. Um, society as organism, we usually have it, I mean, it's quite often in the literature, but it seems that you go to the path of understanding socialism as a process, as an organic process. I would like to just like a short question first and then another comment. So how far epistemologically would you, would, would you pursue this kind of metaphor of organism or uh, let, let's say organic processes? So it's like there is certain accounting of self-regulating mechanism, but on the other hand, you always have this strong awareness that there are like asymmetrical struggles have to kind of take those into account. But then like the other kind of comment, or what I of course very much like in, in your talk is this uh, concept of contested reproduction, right? Uh, but uh, just correct me if I'm wrong, um, it seems to me that at some point um, it becomes maybe uh, too elementary. So if I understood you correctly, uh, the contradictions that kind of happen in the society or become more severe at some point um, create certain impasse, as you call it, or obstacle, structural obstacle. And then at some point you have force. 
force some kind of uh, the other side or the mechanism that kind of breaks through this obstacle. So the force can be either revolutionary or counter-revolutionary. So kind of preservation of the old or kind of coming coming of the new. But then again, um, I think what is uh, here interesting is that um, well. Um, <laughs> Um, well, just to think that um, this, let's say, dialectics of the obstacle and on the other hand this force could be a little bit too simplified. Don't you think that uh, the force itself can be understood rather as some kind of concatenation of different instances, so like, as a certain uh, amelioration of legal, political, ideological instances? So here, the force becomes rather some kind of complex over determination than a simple, let's say, dialectic between obstacle and force. So this is kind of my comment on understanding the constitution of society, if you want, or constitution of society through this primitive accumulation concept. And here I think that, uh, well, the, the social or historical processes become more complicated. Uh, when I use the term force, I'm using it much as Marx does in his section on primitive accumulation. It is not necessarily bloody ruthless methods. It can be legal, uh, such as the IMF conditionality, you know, which was force. What, what I mean by force is that in contested reproduction, and I think this was Priya Przewinsky's real insight, that when you have differing relations, they don't simply coexist. They penetrate each other they, and they create dysfunction. Now that dysfunction can go on for a long time. The question is, does it get resolved? And I'm saying it doesn't probably, you know, maybe in some cases, it, you know, there is a spontaneous process in which one you know, expands at the expense of the other. But if it doesn't happen and if there's a determination to have that side expand at the expense of other, then some form of force, legal, you know, Marx talks about legal in England as opposed to the continent, you know, that was extra legal. It can be anything. It, it is a way of resolving, it, you know, the difficult birth. So I don't know whether that, that sort of really answers you. Know, which is about the, the, the metaphor of, of organic organicism. It seems to me that like it serves um, this kind of organicism of socialism as if we name it a bit differently than what do we gain of calling socialist process or the kind of the hegemonic struggle towards socialism if we call it organic. That's like, because there is a very long tradition in sociology, humanities and so on that kind of rejects the, let's say, the use of organicism or society as a, a certain organism. Well, what I mean basically in, in, in and what I think the concept of organic system um, does um, provide is a way of underlining the you know the interconnection between the elements, the necessary interconnection between the elements. And so, for example, you know, um, in the case where in the, in the, the, the book the socialist alternative, uh, I talk about you know the example of market self-management in Yugoslavia, where there was social ownership of the means of production, worker management, both you know in juridical way terms, but complete lack of any orientation toward a solidaristic economy, toward producing for social needs. And what I argue is that lack of that third side infected the first two sides. So instead of social property, you get group property. Instead of worker management, you get rubber stamping of, of managers' proposals, etc. The infection comes from that side. Um, and that's why, but if we don't think in terms of the interconnection of the three, of production, distribution, and consumption, we might not think to say, what is the effect of this on the others? So that's why I think that it imposes a, a kind of you know, logical discipline. Okay.
I guess we can take one or, or maybe two more questions if there is someone interested. If not, this one. Yes. <laughs> yes. Good morning. Hi, of course. Uh, <laughs> the repeat here, Mike. I, the, you just confused me when you said that in Yugoslavia there was no production according to need. Uh, because what was the housing of the firms? Of course, that need, the solidarity was within the firms, not on the level of, for example, local authorities, like in the UK, who built enormous housing projects in the UK. So what do you mean when you say that in Yugoslavia production was not according to need if the health and education and housing and pensions were socialized on different level, either state level or firm level? One of the things that, you know, when I was talking about solidarity, there certainly was solidarity within the individual enterprises. Uh, but there wasn't solidarity between enterprises. Uh, and that's one of the things Che Guevara pointed out in 1959 when he came. He said, a very interesting system, but how, what is co competition between workers got to do with the socialist spirit? You know, uh, this, you know, he worried about that particular point. Um, and that certainly, you know, was lacking. That was there, that competition among workers. Now the party, the party took the position that, well, we will encourage cooperation among different firms by telling them that if you work together, you'll make more money. Uh, it was th that was the concept of solidarity. And any attempt to say, oh, what about inequality that's growing in the society? What about the need for, you know, sort of producing directly for people's needs? Uh, and what about the problem of a new class emerging as managers? That was called ultra-leftism, anarchism, et cetera, and condemned. Uh, that, I think, was a manifestation of a particularly bad model uh, in terms of the orientation towards social needs, etc. So, yeah. It's what you were you to also referred in your seven difficult questions, short text that you wrote, when you already raised that question there. But I think with your, the, quest, the, the text you wrote, the seven difficult questions about... Uh, uh -huh. Yes, you already raised it. But the thing is, it was only housing, per se, as a need that was within the firm. Pensions, health, education, sport, recreation, that was on the state level, or republican level later, especially after the, after the 74 uh, constitution. So, uh, I think your analysis partly holds true, but not entirely for Yugoslavia. Or at least you should refine it to, you know, to give it, give it a, a richer account of empirical reality in Yugoslavia. But maybe for the next book, we'd love to read it. <laughs> well, I guess this is a good conclusion. Of course, we're all looking for it. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to use the opportunity to invite you to two exciting roundtables that will take place tomorrow. The first beginning at 11 a.m., building a new left in the Balkans. And then at 6 p.m., toward the European left strategy of building a socialist interpretive. Michael, thank you once again.